on diamonds. Last time we might have drawn octahedrons more than we should have, but at least that is stored in your memory banks. Today we're going to go into Roman numeral 2 on diamonds, and it is going to be geologic occurrence. What are the geologic environments that produce diamonds? And then where do we find them? Because they actually end up being in different places. Because diamonds come from the mantle. So we're going to put here mantle formation. Now when you think about the Earth's mantle, I want this sort of picture to come to mind. Where we have, this is something I showed when we were talking about olivine and the gemstone peridot, because most of the mantle is made up of this mineral right here, which is called olivine. There's also other minerals like clinopyroxene down there and orthopyroxene, but olivine, when it's in gem form, is called peridot. And when it got brought up to their surface, it came up in basaltic magmas, right, that accidentally brought these, um, let's see, these were xenoliths, right? This is just all background. So this is how we learned a lot about the Earth's mantle, what it looks like. Well, there can be diamonds that also grow within this greener matrix. It just requires really special conditions. So we're going to say here, we're going to say, one, recall peridotite. This is the rock type that is the most of the mantle. But there can be, let's say, um, diamonds may crystallize in peridotite mantle. in peridotite mantle if there are carbon-rich fluids moving through it. And that's our biggest requirement. If carbon-rich fluids are present. That carbon may be in the form of CO2. And this may seem like a weird supposition, but, I mean, come on, we have diamonds, therefore there has to be carbon, right? They kind of begs it. But where does the carbon come from? Well, that could be an issue. There's two possible. It could be called primordial carbon. This is just carbon that was there because when the earth was created and was forming, there was carbon there. Or you can actually have organic carbon that gets recycled down via plate tectonics and subduction. So let's say subduction recycles in carbon. And we find diamonds made from both of these sources. Where in the mantle does this material come from? Well, to talk about that, I need to introduce you to the concept of a geotherm. And specifically, it follows what's called the cratonic or continental geotherm. How do, what does this mean? What does this look like? Well, to, to understand a geotherm, we need to have a graph. And in this graph, we're going to have temperature be the x-axis going from 400 Celsius, all right, that's hot, up to 1600 Celsius. That is super hot. All right, so we can put our tick marks for the other numbers through here. And maybe you know something about the Earth. The deeper you go in the Earth, the hotter it gets, right? That's the concept of the geotherm. The concept here is deeper in Earth equals hotter. And the rate at which you get hotter is the geotherm. There can be two different, so what we're going to have here is we're going to have depth as our y-axis, and it's going to be in kilometers. And let's see, we're going to have like uh, 90 kilometers here, we'll have 180 kilometers here. This will be the Earth's surface. Well, there's a place on Earth called the, well, the oceanic crust, right? And the oceanic crust has a very hot geotherm. That means that the temperatures get very hot, here, but not doesn't require very deep. So we're going to draw a line here, and we're going to call this the oceanic geotherm. It gets hot fast. Right? That maybe could be a note here, hot fast. So what would something that gets hot slow look like? Well, we have to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until we get um, to a hot temperature. And so that ends up being what the continental geotherm looks like. It goes like something like this. And that we're going to label continental. This is how fast the Earth gets hotter as you go deeper underneath continents. Now, how this relates to diamonds is that there is a graphite to diamond stability line. And it crosses the continental geotherm. At all temperatures, or at all depths shallower than this line, graphite is the stable form of carbon. At all depths greater than this line, 
diamond is the stable form of carbon. So we have to be in an environment where rocks are in the diamond stability field, and that is all along that continental geotherm. So we expect to find diamonds forming in the mantle below continents. That's what this graph predicts. And the actual numbers that are predicted is that diamonds should form at 140 kilometers or greater depth. All right, so diamonds are coming from very deep in the earth. That's important. And the temperatures are between 900 Celsius to about 1400 Celsius. So very hot, deep rocks. Now that actually ends up presenting a bit of a problem to us because how can you get material from that deep of conditions up to the Earth's surface? That's a real trick. Well, we'll get to that in just a second. Let me show you a, geogra a map. This is coming from that Tappert and Tappert textbook that shows the distribution of diamond deposits on Earth. I'm trying to make this bigger. Well, if we see where most of the diamonds come from, look at where they're occurring. They're not in the oceanic crust here shown in blue. They're even, they're mostly in these darker purples, right? All the South African, the Australian locations, our famous Russian locations, the Brazilian deposits, they're all coming from the thickest parts of the Earth's crust because they're following along a geotherm. So if we were to try to put this into a conceptual picture in your mind, this is what I'd want you to picture. And I don't think you really necessarily need to draw this. Although it's not a hard one to draw, right? You could, you have, well, I mean, I guess we could try to do it, right? We could do it in two dimensions. So let's just say we have a continent here, and there's the keel of our continent, and then here is the mountain range, and we have a subducting slab going down below, right? So there's our subducting slab, there's our craton here. We are saying, all right, where are diamonds forming? Well, let's see, there's a graphite diamond stability. So they drew a line in that says at higher pressure diamond is stable, graphite's here, that's what this graph is showing, and that we should expect to find our diamonds in the lithosphere and in the mantle, all right? So we're gonna say this is lithospheric mantle below our continents. That's all it's showing. And so if you were a diamond exploration person, you would not look here for diamonds. You would not look here for diamonds. You'd be trying to go to these areas of purple that have our thickest cratons, our thickest blocks of continental crust. That's a primary control on where diamonds occur on Earth. Now getting them to the Earth's surface is a whole nother deal, and that requires kimberlite volcanism. We need to have magmas forming down in the mantle that bring the diamonds and other things up to the Earth's surface. Volcanism. Right, this is going to bring diamonds to surface. In fact, in our sketch before, notice where are these red lines with little like party hats on the top? Well, those are our kimberlites. So what we're saying is there needs to be pockets of magma that are forming down here that then rise up through the earth and then erupt. And as they do that, Sometimes the magma is going to carry diamonds with it to bring diamonds up to the Earth's surface. All right, that's the whole concept of kimberlite volcanism. So what do we need to say about this? Well, that kimberlite is a very rare kind of magma. It's a very carbon-rich kimberlite. Magma is rare. And the eruptions are fairly rare. In fact, as we look over the whole Earth, we just saw that map, there in the history of Earth, there has been about 6,000 kimberlite eruptions throughout Earth's history that we've found. Well, it actually seems like a pretty big number. Um, only a thousand of these contain diamonds, even though all of them come from the Earth man the, the mantle. So kimberlite magmas are rare. Let's say this. Let's say that they um, come from deep mantle. And the other thing that the kimberlite magmas do is as they rise, they rip up chunks of the mantle and carry them with them. How do we say that? Well, remember the word xenolith. So we're going to say that xenoliths, these are our foreign rock chunks of mantle, are ripped up by ascending magma. 
That is our mechanism, ascending magma. Now, the mantle, it's all kinds of chunks of mantle. It's not just diamonds, but diamonds can be a part of it. So we'll just say diamonds are one of the types of xenon. Or you could even think of those as xenocrysts, right? Because they're crystals. Peridotite is the main thing that comes up along, along the way. So we're going to find other crystals like, uh, let's just say here, we're going to find olivines at, in peridotite. Well, we're going to find peridotites, sorry, in kimberlites, peridotites. We're going to find garnets. We're going to find ilmenites and chromites. These are other minerals that are going to come up along with. These are considered indicator minerals that maybe diamonds are there indicator minerals so prospectors are going to be looking for kimberlites by looking for indicator minerals and then maybe finding diamonds of all the kimberlites that have erupted so let's go back up here to the 6000 of the 6000 that we have found only 1000 of them have diamonds so it's not every time but a lot the eruptions themselves, let's talk about that really quickly. They erupt at the surface explosively. So let me make sure. This is number two. This is number two. So we're going to say two here. We're going to say that they erupt explosively. And when they do that, they make this kind of cratered pipe. It's called a diatreme. It kind of looks like a funnel or a carrot-shaped crater. That's what we're going to say. Well, it's just... That's a nice description. This is a carrot-shaped crater that forms when the kimberlite explosively erupts. That crater is filled with magma and xenoliths of the mantle and maybe diamonds. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to put in a picture. I've lifted this off of Wikipedia showing a diatreme. Here's our carrot, right? It's even orange for us. That's nice. Now, the Kimberlite goes, this goes all the way down to the Earth's mantle. And it rises up as magma, ripping up chunks along the way. Here's some diamond xenoliths inside of it. And it creates this crater. Here's an ejecta. We call it a tough ring. A lot of times this stuff gets eroded away, right? If it, let's say the kimberlite formed a billion years ago, well, the upper part will get eroded away. Maybe even this will get eroded away. That's what these things are showing here on the side. The mine called Jager Fonstein, the mine called Kimberly, all this upper part's been eroded away by time. All the diamonds have been put into alluvial systems to find by plaster mining. And the primary mines just are digging into this material. So I actually wanted you to draw this. Uh, how could you do that? We'd, we'd have to draw some kind of crater. All right, that goes down. All right, we're just kind of mimicking this picture here to have something like this in your notes. We've got some crater wall, or sorry, some um, the tough rings. Then this all gets filled by material that shoots out and then falls back in during the explosion. So this is all just a big jumbled mess. Down here, this is our dike, and here, this is our diatreme. So this is what a kimberlite volcano looks like from the side. Well, from above, what does it look like? Well, it kind of just looks like a circle. And that's one of the interesting things about when you're prospecting for diamonds. You're looking for, let's say we're gonna look for diatreme pipes. From the bird's eye view, a diatreme pipe is not that big. It could only, maybe, let's we'll just say like a few hundred meters. So maybe 100 meters, maybe a thousand meters um, diameter circles. That's kind of the extent laterally that we'd expect to find. They are filled with, what is this going to be? We're going to talk about what they're filled with now. Well, they're going to be filled with kimberlite, magma, and xenoliths. And it's just going to be a jumbled mess. So when we find a deposit, it's going to be filled with mixed. Another word for mixed would be heterogeneous rock composed of fragments of magma and mantle. Filled with mixed fragments of magma and xenoliths. 
Let me show you a couple pictures. These are both from Tappert and Tappert. If we were to look at a deposit, just here's a hand lens for scale. There's a boulder. You can just see there's all these bouldery rock fragments stuck within this slightly greenish matrix. If we were to look at this under a microscope, what would it look like? Well, it looks similarly fragmented where there's just crystals all kind of juxtaposed against one another with some matrix in between, okay? So that's the idea here is that it's mixy or it's very messy mixed up rock. This is the primary deposit. So what we're heading to next is that we're going to talk about mining these deposits. So let's say, um, let's call this C. We're going to call them mining diamonds. Well, the number one way we do it now is by the primary source. So we actually find these 6,000 kimberlites on Earth. So we're mining primary kimberlites. These are things, like I just said, a, hundred, a couple hundred meters across. And then we just dig down, usually with open pit mining at first. What does that look like? Well, here's two of the more famous um, pit mines on Earth. This one is called Ekati, and Ekati is in Canada, where they found a kimberlite, and they're just digging down deeper and deeper and deeper, taking out the diamond-rich material. This one is called, um, oh boy, I'm going to, Uda, Uda China? Oh, I said it wrong. Anyways, it's in Russia. But look how similar the mines look. It's because they're just following the pipes down into the subsurface. As we continue, let's see, um, we talked about that, that, that of the 6,000 kimberlites that have been found, only 1,000 of them had diamonds, right? Well, of that 1,000, only 100 had economically viable deposits. And what does that mean? Like if you were to find a kimberlite on your land, well, you would need to probably mine somewhere between 500 to 10,000 tons of ore. And within that ore, what you need to find is stones that are bigger than a carrot. I mean, you have to find a lot of carrots, maybe like uh, two to three carrots per ton. Eh, that'd be pretty rich per ton. That would make it economically viable. And of those, they can't just be a bunch of tiny ones. No way. We need them to be fairly big. So you need to have the diamonds be 0 0.5 carats or bigger in order to have a viable mine these days. Of course, you have to consider the climate, the political uh, stability of the country, the environmental impact. All these things matter to make your mine be viable or not. Now, much of the mining is alluvial. Right, because these pipes erode through time, just washing material. If Kimberly is mining from this depth down, where did all this go? Well, it went off into the river systems. So that's where we're going to go next here. We're going to go to, this is going to be um, alluvial systems. We know that diamonds are very hard, right? So we're going to say hardness and High density are very favorable for this. This keeps them from breaking, and the high density makes them enrich in the placers. So these are both good combinations. These alluvial systems can either be rivers or marine. And there's an image from the GIA uh, training. I've We've drawn in our notes before when we talked about this, where we're going to take our primary source. It's going to erode through time into the rivers, forming these enriched deposits, right? So that's what you're picturing when we think about alluvial systems. Maybe a more real-life picture, you'd be picturing something like this, right? Where here we have rivers that are moving material down from the mountains where the kimberlites may be and enriching them maybe on this bank or maybe on that. Well, that would take your prospecting skills to figure out. Now, for 2,000 years, it was deposits like these. For 2,000 plus years, all mining was alluvial. All the mining in India, then the big discoveries in Brazil in the 1700s, these were just along the Amazon River and tributaries of the Amazon. They hadn't found any primary kimberlites. So in 1965, 
or in the 1960s, let's say, I think the number, it was like 80% of world production was alluvial. But nowadays, so let's put it today, it's only 25% of production. And that means most of our production today is, is from primary deposits. And it's just because that these are richer and you can set up infrastructure. They tend to be richer and ready for infrastructure. Now, the alluvial system is very good because higher quality diamonds are preserved. The ones with fractures, they get destroyed by transport. And so we're, we're just going to, this is going to be like one of the last things we're going to say here, is we're just going to say that um, alluvial systems preserve higher quality material because fractures and lower quality stones get sorted out. Oh, that's too much to say. Let's say, say flawed fracture material are broken down and they're just destroyed by the erosional process. So when you do find alluvial diamonds, they tend to be really high quality, good stones. There's a lot of different ways that people search um, and prospect across the land. I wanted to just throw a couple in here. So one, of course, they would just go and they would pan rivers. That's an interesting way to do it. People fly airplanes over the ground and try to um, look for different magnetic responses. I couldn't find any good pictures of that. Here's a one that's uh, an interesting way to do it in more humid climates. You go and you look at termite mines, mounds, and you see what minerals the termites have brought to their surface. And if you find indicator minerals in the termite mounds, so what you do is you hunt termite mounds for indicator minerals. You're not going to find diamonds. Those are too rare. But you could find things like garnet or ilmenite in the termite mines, mounds, and then you might think that's a good place to mine. Another interesting way that it's been done in Africa is it was recognized that there's this plant called pandanus candelabrum. It's this plant right here. It kind of looks like a mangrovey plant. Well, it only grows in kimberlites. And when people recognize that, they were able to find all sorts of primary kimberlite deposits. That's kind of a neat story of prospecting. I'll write it down here. Pandanus candelabrum. It's only in West Africa, so they haven't found an equivalent plant for Australia or United States or South America. And if you can find that, you are going to be in luck, probably, because you'll be able to find the 6001 Kimberlite.